Well, uh, I would like to welcome you here on uh, our forum on data and reporting. Um, my name is Christian Schober. I'm here from Vienna University of Economics and Business. And I do quite a lot of uh, research and data analysis on people with disabilities uh, in different contexts. And I'm very happy uh, today to uh, have the possibility to chair a very high-level uh, forum. Uh, around me there uh, are persons, uh, women actually, we discussed it before, I'm like the quota man here, um, from, from United Kingdom, from Ireland, from the States, from Singapore, from Thailand, from Spain, and uh, they are, all have something in common. They are interested in uh, one of the most interesting things in life, data. <laughs> yeah, it is like, uh, and if you're not that interested in data, you will uh, at least see that it's really an important thing. Uh, and well, I would like to welcome you here, uh, and you are going to say two or three sentences to yourself uh, at the beginning of your presentation. Um, what is it about? Why are we going to talk about data? It's about visibility. You know, in a world that is uh, increasingly building up on data, visibility is everything. Without data, in case of doubt, there are no decisions. And therefore, we need data. And uh, what kind of data? Well, that's interesting. Uh, I had, um, about two years ago, a project in a region in Austria uh, and we were invited to screen all social services. It were 70 services, and about 10 of them were for people with disabilities. And they had really a huge amount of data. They had the numbers, they had like the need of support, they had uh, information on costs. But what they didn't have was information on the quality of life of people with disabilities. And we suggested uh, to steer, to control the system, the services on basis of uh, quality of life data. And they were very hesitant to do that because they said it's not possible to get this kind of data in a valid and reliable way. And I think that's the point we are going to talk about today, like whether it is possible to get data on uh, people with disabilities well it in uh, in uh, in reliable manner and then we will ask who should provide the data who can provide the data uh, should people with disabilities be involved in each and every step of the process why is it difficult to get valid data on aspects why are people with disabilities are excluded from surveys, and they are, for example, in Austria. They are not part of it if they live in some kind of institutions. The questions are not appropriate, and so on. There are three parts today of our forum. Part one is like a presentations from all of us. We'll need about 45 minutes. Then a reply to concluding questions. Uh, each of us has a concluding question or a thesis and we will like hand it over to you and we'll ask you to agree or not to agree. And if you agree with the question, I would ask you like to nod with your head or like give me some other kind of sign uh, that you uh, are agree or if you don't agree, then do the other way around. Uh, in a part two, the panel uh, will uh, reply to the questions as well. It's like expert to expert. And in the part three, uh, it, there will be some minutes left that you can bring in your own questions. Uh, yeah, well, I start uh, also with a topic because, like I said, I'm interested in the quality of life uh, surveys of uh, people with intellectual disabilities. And we did a project, it was called One Voice for Everybody. It's like translated from German because it was a German uh, project. Uh, and in this project, uh, we did together with Caritas and with the National Statistics System, Statistic Austria and Öpia, uh, a project with the objectives to reduce barriers for people with intellectual disabilities, uh, to check how plain language for accessible surveys in social statistics, in standardized social statistics are available, 
and to investigate the possibilities and limitations of institutional residents and uncovering difficulties and issues of people with intellectual disabilities. And I'm going just to rush through a few conclusions uh, we draw out of, these, uh, of this research project. First of all, it is possible you can raise data. There are intellectual limitations, but there are no ultimate uh, obstacle to standardized questioning. Second, you have to reduce. You need to reduce. Uh, means like you have to develop uh, an accessible tool. Then you have to take care not to dis distort meaning because simplifications sometimes uh, come up with another meaning of the question. You have to keep it short. Too long interviews are to be avoided because people cannot attend the interview that long. Use plain language, but it's important. It's just the first step. You have to take care of much more things. Use pictures and pictograms. Stay close to the life of the people. It's important because there they can really give valid answers. If, to, if you ask uh, them like how they feel they have the possibility to participate in political processes and they never had or the chance to participate, then you won't get any valid answers. Paid work questions are very difficult because people normally don't get uh, something paid. Do not include other persons. Third parties like carers or others are distorting the situation. And good interviewer training is absolutely essential and that means it gets more expensive because you have to prepare properly. And peer service, facilitate the access, but be careful because the minimum requirement is to, to have the ability to present a standardized questionnaire. And there is also devaluing behavior of the persons surveyed. For example, one of the participants, one of the peers said, Peter is too stupid for this survey. You have to take this into account and uh, uh, try to handle it. And now to the question, do you agree or not? My question to you, to the audience is, at any rate, people with intellectual disability should be included in quality of life qu surveys, even if the questions are not always appropriate for their real reality of life. What do you mean? Would you say yes, you agree, or not? Yeah, you can start, or do you have to think about it? No? Yes? Just like nodding, or saying yes, or something like this. I cannot see you. Okay, <laughs> then do it another way around. Uh, who is able to stand up? Please stand up. Who says yes? It's a movement. <laughs> if you, okay. No, it's like I'd say a, a, a slight majority agrees. Others do not. Okay, that brings me now to uh, uh, to, to to Daphne. Uh, hello, welcome yeah, here. Thank and you. now uh, it's on you to explain uh, something out of your work, and I'm really curious to hear about it. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, so thank you first of all for the uh, invitation to the Essel Foundation. It's my uh, first time. My name is Daphne Arendt and I work for the European Foundation for the Improvement of Living and Working Conditions, that's Eurofound in short, and we are an agency uh, of the European Union where I work in the Social Policy Unit. And, um, we have recently published a policy brief that looks uh, specifically at the social and employment situation of people with disabilities in the EU, aged uh, 18 to 64, and we also look at some areas of the European disability strategy, and we examine the subjective well-being of people with disability and also what factors uh, influence their well-being. And uh, our brief is based on data from our European Quality of Life survey. And the EQLS is a survey of people aged 18 and over living in private households. So people in institutions are excluded. Uh, we've had four rounds so far. The last round was in 2016. 
where we interviewed close to 40,000 people in 33 European countries face to face in their homes. And the survey makes it possible to track key trends in people's quality of life. And we see quality of life as a broad concept, the EQLS measures or includes both objective circumstances and how people feel about their lives in general. So it covers issues such as employment, income, education, housing, family, health, work-life balance, and subjective topics uh, like life satisfaction, happiness, perception of society, uh, issues of trust and tensions between different groups. Now, what can we do with uh, EQLS data? We can uh, use the data to examine the quality of life of people with disabilities at EU level. We can break this down by age, gender, employment status, education and income. Uh, however, it is uh, um, not so easy to make comparisons between countries because of cultural bias. And on top of it, the sample is too small for analyses at country level because um, of the 37,000 interviewees, around 12% had uh, uh, identified themselves as having uh, a disability. So I'm next going to show you a few results. I wanted to start with the disability employment gap. That's the percentage difference in employment rates of people with and without uh, disabilities. And as you can see on top, for the EU as a whole, the, uh, the green line is 2011, uh, the blue one is 2016. Things have improved. Uh, the gap is now smaller. But what's worrying is that the um, gap actually increased for those with lower education levels. So that is um, where you see primary, the third uh, from below. It was 21, it was 15% in 2011, and the gap is now uh, 21 percentage points. Okay, uh, and here you can see this. Uh, in fact, 21% of people with disabilities completed tertiary education compared to 30% uh, that are not disabled. And in fact, people with disabilities are overrepresented in the lower education uh, bracket. And that tells us something about unequal access to education. And in fact, here you see that that educational attainment gap has increased. I'm going to be quick now, because I also want to show you some other findings, namely a more positive result that social participation has improved significantly between 2011 and 2016. And the rate of participation in social activities is now the same for people with and without disabilities. Nevertheless, the fact is that people with disabilities rate their life satisfaction less well than people without disabilities. And this applies to all age groups and to all four income quartiles. So let me finish then by providing you with two key policy messages. First of all, better policies are needed to ensure equal access to education. And secondly, while removing the risk of poverty and ensuring adequate living standards is, of course, an important policy priority, people with disabilities also need more so than people without disabilities non-monetary support measures. My question to you is whether you agree or disagree that social surveys of the general population are useful to monitor and compare the situation of people with disabilities. So if you agree, please stand up, <laughs> if you can. If, if you disagree, please stay seated. Come on, it's like a bit seated. physical activity. It's good for all. Eh? You, you all disagree. I see very few people <laughs> agreeing. That's good for the discussion. You agree, yes, I uh, understood. <laughs> the majority does not agree. Social surveys of the general population are not useful to monitor and compare the situation of people with disabilities. Okay. Interesting. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, then we are going to pass. Sorry. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Siri. Not Tong Siri, but you just can call me Siri. As um, iPhone Siri, but I used this name before. Um, I would like to. 
<laughs> Thank you very much for having us here. And I'm here with my colleague, uh, Ms. Kanika Saroy Suwan over there. We have been working for quite a long time together. And then when we heard about the, um, the call for a proposal from the Zero Project from my from uh, my friend, and we thought that it might be very interesting to bring us here, and this is the very first time that we uh, being uh, participate in the um, Zero Project Conference, so thank you very much. And I would like to share with you, uh, quite different from the, what Daphne uh, just told you, I would like to share with you the very smaller scale at the individual level and at the community level as well. Because I just have been using the WHO ICF, the International Classification Fun of Functioning, Disability and Health, to promote quality of life of persons with disabilities at the community-based rehabilitation. So some of you might familiar with the conceptual framework of ICF, where six factors are um, interacting with each other and coming up with the functions of a person. So it doesn't mean that person with disabilities only can use the ICF. I think everybody should look at this conceptual framework and see what what is lim what limit your functions, and then you can just add up with the with with the um, the factor to to improve your function, i.e., the quality of life. So from this conceptual framework, I. Um, trying to mix it up or use it in uh, all together with the CBR matrix, the community-based rehabilitation matrix, also from the WHO. And I think the CBR matrix, the health, education, livelihood, social, and empowerment can be harmonizingly used to improve quality of life of persons with disabilities. The problem is, what, is the, what are the data that we need to identify the needs of persons with disabilities that I think ICF can use? And because the ICF is the classification system that um, trying to uh, say about the degree or the level of difficulties. So I just put up, uh, come up with the ICF-based questionnaire doing the data collection of the a person with disabilities living in communities. So we just have a training of interviewers, send them out, and then talk with individual persons at their home. And we collect the data in personal data, impairment types, activity of daily livings, mobilities, both in home and outside, education, employment, social participation, and also benefits that they are uh, get from the from the Thai government, and you can see at the top lower or the right hand side the level of difficulties. Uh, have we have like five levels? Level zero is mean independently, no abnormality, no disabilities at all. Number four is the unable to move or the extreme level of difficulty. So in short, or make it simple, if you have number zero in the, your ICF profile, it means that you have high, qual high quality of life. But if you have more the number of number four, it means that you are very, very severe, uh, severe in the disabilities. So I'm trying to come up with the presentation of the, of the, of the data by trying to illustrate the level of difficulties in, for example, in cleaning themselves, dressing, eating, urination management, defecation management, and so on. So I know uh, for the person, what is the numbers of person who have number zero, and what is the proportion of person who have number um, uh, difficulties at level four, that, that data can identify the um, level of needs of person with disabilities and can point out the, the helps or the service that can be prepared according to the needs of individual person with disabilities. And also, I would like to show you the um, home modification needs of person with disabilities and we have the bed, ramp, toilet, and others. And we, and we saw that the, the people who have a higher number of unmodified, so we know how much of them who are in needs. 
And this is how we do the data collection and share with the community leaders and local communities. And also when we use or when we give them the needs, we can also um, uh, give the number of what different before and after the, the service as well. So I would like to ask whether you agree or not that the function-oriented data, so in this, in this case it is ICF, can be used to harmonize the service from many different government and non-governmental um, organization to try to um, make a service and then use the data to enhance quality of life of persons with disabilities. You don't want to stand up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's like a small majority again. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to pass over to Christina. Well, esteemed members of the panel, it's lovely to actually hear this discussion as it's coming down. It's going to allow me to um, step through the first bit a little more quickly because actually both in a small scale and in a large scale and, and each one of the panel members have been talking about some of the elements I've um, covered off. So, um, I'm Christine Hempel from Open Inclusion. We're based out of the UK. We do a lot of research mainly for organisations trying to understand how their products and services work for people with various access needs. Um, mainly do qualitative research but we're also working on uh, quite large quantitative research and bringing that together with qualitative to better understand overall impact of any, um, any change. So, My general thesis in, in this is that mixed methodology research for evaluating interventions, whether it's product, process or policy, are better than either qualitative or quantitative alone. And traditionally in the economic sphere, if it couldn't be numerated in a way that was seen to be reliable, consistent, comparable, and particularly financial, it was left to the side. And to me, that underestimated total impact, because the total impact of the change include the changed human condition as well as the economic costs and benefits. It's actually quite easy measuring each of them. I think the trick is in how we bring them together. So what I think of this is the qualitative residual. What can be numerated is easier to numerate because then it's been brought basically to a single denominator. Not everything can be though, and in fact you know, Christians talk about quality of life and Daphne's as well. This is something we think about quite deeply and it can't always be turned into a number. And that, to me, is that kind of thick data of qualitative residual. Um, interestingly, this is a space that right at the moment there's quite a lot of discussion in the economic field as to bringing this into economics so it's not just um, out there in the kind of put at it on after, but how do we bring this into the overall evaluation. We've done quite a lot of work on the return of investment in inclusion, particularly in digital. And for that, what we did was a lot of quantitative analysis, you know, costs, people impacted, benefit of the impact in terms of the customer lifetime value. But also there's a qualitative analysis, which is doing surveys with users um, of, the, um, of the product and space and actually usability testing itself, finding the points of friction and finding the barriers in the journey. Um, from the other side, A-B tests are particularly powerful if you're looking for something that's quite hard to measure because you can do one environment versus another, versus another very similar environment and that can have both quantitative and qualitative elements to it. Um, in terms of the environment, if you choose that um, an inclusive uh, program or a intervention should be measured on this mixed methodology with quantitative and qualitative, the thing that's really important and powerful is making sure that the research is done that can listen to and gather the information, whether, where, where, whichever side of that quant or qual side it's going to feed into, in a way that's able to listen, to, to open the space and then listen to the responses and analyse those responses powerfully. So some of the things we've learned as practitioners on the ground of this that I thought might be worth sharing, and it's basically adding to Christian's list here. So some of these have been covered off. 
the absolute basics for anyone. It's f whether anyone's got physical, sensory or cognitive needs that they feel safe, confident and supported. And if you come back to that as a test, you know, the rest of it's just the detail below that because that's when they'll be confident to share with you everything that you're wanting to listen to. So the practical stuff of the venue, venue accessibility, maps and travel instructions, that's actually the, the kind of um, helping people prepare um, ahead of time. Include visual journeys. We take a lot of images of what the journey is from the station to the venue or through the venue to the room so people can see ahead of time what's going to happen. Tell people what will happen. Give them a discussion about it. Sometimes we do um, uh, things like little videos of, hi, I'm Christine. We're going to do some, some research with you in a few days' time, just 30 seconds. We're going to ask you questions about this environment. And, oh, sorry, and it's going to be in this format. And we're really looking forward to meeting you all. And that's enough to kind of, to a large degree, put people at ease. Ensure that there's a support person on hand. It does take um, a support person to be there for people's individual needs. And then the researchers are able to do the research. And the support person is simply there to look after everyone's needs. And give people explicit permission to opt out. This is really important for people to know that there's a quiet space they can go to or they can just choose to take a moment. Um, and supporting the broader community, whether that's service dogs, carers, family that comes in. I'm going to jump through. Um, there is some stuff around communication to think about. This is all goes back to that um, how you support everyone's needs and preferences. Actually, again, some of this was shared this morning. Also about how you connect people's ideas and games having lots of different ways of getting to the same thing. We use props, we use it um, to elicit stories. Things like wands and dice. Dice are great. Throw the dice, if you get an a, a odd number, you tell a negative story. If you get an even number, you tell a positive story. It makes it fun. Just little ways of making it easier for people. So the question. This really comes to that idea of nothing about us without us. Um, concept that how do we get more voice into it and how do we allow that quantitative and qualitative feedback to come through better. Um, my question is, is the research community engaging people with disabilities sufficiently and appropriately to maximise the quality of products, services and policies being created? Essentially making sure that any money we put into the system or any effort we put in is having the greatest impact. Well, again, you can read the question who does agree that the research community or who says yes does engage enough sufficiently? Yes or not? No? Who says yes? Raise your hand, stand up, nod. I think it's a clear no, isn't it? Yeah. Who, who, say, who says no? No? Hands up? Oh wow, that's really clear. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, well, then uh, now, uh, Francesca, uh, yes. you're uh, on the row. Please, here's your presenter. And I'm curious to listen to your Thank presentation. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Just here to, now it's, ah, okay. it's yours. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you uh, very much for inviting me. Um, so, uh, well, I'll give you a little uh, background of uh, G3ICT. G3ICT is an NGO, uh, and it was created about 12 years ago, at the initiative of UNDESA, the United Nations Division of Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, we have a, a, a charter to promote uh, ICT accessibility provisions uh, as per the CRPD. And uh, we work actually with the multi-stakeholders approach, uh, working with persons with disabilities, with industry, with uh, public sector, international organizations, and uh, experts in accessibility. Um, my work is institutional relations, so um, uh, I oversee relations with all these uh, multi-stakeholders. Um, how we came up to the DARE Index is because during our uh, years of advocacy around the world, uh, we uh, realized actually that no data was available in most countries um, in tracking uh, the accessibility of uh, digital contents and services. Uh, and if there was, a, it was uh, often biased. So uh, we decided to uh, uh, launch the, this uh, index uh, after 
it was a, pro a progress from the CRPD progress report initially to the DR index that we launched actually uh, at the end of uh, last year, 2018, with the, the objectives to provide an in tool, uh, a tool for in country advocates to benchmark and uh, track the progress made uh, by their countries in implementing digital accessibility policies and progresses as per the CRPD provisions. Uh, so we, we work uh, with uh, um, a global panel of uh, persons with disabilities, advocates, uh, researchers and community leaders identified in partnership with Disabled Peoples International, uh, RIADIS and other advocacy organizations. And uh, the global outreach was about 121 uh, countries this year, I mean last year, 89% of the world population approximately. So the, this, uh, the, what well, we are measuring actually the uh, commitment, uh, capacity to implement, and outcomes. And all the, these uh, um, variables are uh, based on uh, either the ITU, G3ICT, ICT accessibility <laughs> model policy report uh, for what concerns uh, legal and policy foundations, uh, which are the key laws that a country needs to have. Uh, in order, law and regulation, in order to uh, do policy making in ICT accessibility, uh, capacity to implement which are the processes that the country needs to have, uh, which is also based on the ICT model policy, uh, and outcomes. The outcomes, uh, we are looking at 10 key areas of technology. Um, and these were selected by uh, during Oh, okay. Uh, during a meeting of uh, DPI and IDA and G3ICT uh, call for action at the United Nations in 2016. Um, the method is, uh, the scoring and benchmarking method is really simple. It's based on um, uh, points that are assigned, uh, simple, like to benchmark progress by indexes, uh, 20 key variables for each country. Um, and so we have a five uh, points per, for country commitments, five for capacity to implement, ten for outcomes. And uh, with each of the 20 variables, so we count five points for a maximum of 100 points for each country. And do, we do have a, a scoring, a guided scoring, which is the most difficult part is the scoring of outcomes, but we do have a guide, guided evaluation of, uh, scores for outcomes. Um, I put this chart because I think uh, this, uh, is the, the, this uh, shows the relations between the, um, the DR index score uh, by, um, econo uh, sorry, um, by, um, uh, with levels of economic development, and this, uh, I think, reflects quite well the real world assessment of, uh, of their country status by our respondents, our panelists, which are all advocates. Um, finally, I just want to say in terms of data collection, we do a survey, we just use an, an accessible word questionnaire in local language to allow for research um, time and editing by respondents. We use closed questions and uh, comment boxes for references. Uh, we do a verification by our analysts, GTICT of historic data discontinuities or results out of predictable range. Uh, we postpone the publishing of data when we are not sure, so in order to validate, because obviously uh, there, there may be a mis miscommunication or misinterpretation. Uh, and uh, finally, we uh, publish the, on the website with the feedback mechanism, so uh, sort of a crowdsource. Uh, mechanism that we have on the website, you, you can find on our website all the database uh, with the 121 countries and you can review the scores and give us also your feedback. Uh, and we do that for transparency and grassroots, to get uh, transparency and grassroots feedback. So the question is agree or not, so persons with disabilities should always be involved in the definition and implementation of data collection about disability. Do you agree or not? <laughs> uh, shall I ask? Thank is you there very much. someone who does not agree? Does not agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if anyone wants to contribute, actually, with their own country to the data collection, I'd be happy and I'm here <laughs> to collect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sumita? Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Hi. Um, so my name is Sumita. 
and um, I'm from Singapore from the Disabled People's Association. So I guess today my presentation is going to take a little bit of a different stance from everybody else. It's going to talk a little bit about our journey on developing the CRPD Parallel Report. And because of the unique way our social service is structured in Singapore, the possible barriers that we are currently facing. Um, so just a bit of a background. Um, the Singapore signed the CRPD in November um, 2012 and ratified it in 2013. However, it has reservations on three articles, Article 12, 25, and 29. And however, even though we've signed the CRPD, we do not recognize psychosocial disabilities as a disability. It's categorized separately as a mental health issue. Um, so in Singapore, what happens is the Singapore government has developed a set, a set of recommendations broken up into five-year periods called the Enabling Master Plan. And these are mostly recommendations for the development of inclusive policies by the different ministries, they are not binding um, commitments. So ministries can choose to take them on or leave them out. Um, so for example, recent policy changes to the Compulsory Education Act, which finally included students with moderate to severe disabilities, um, it does not really take into account the current infrastructure in the educational system. So schools might not be sufficiently equipped for full integration. So one example of this is Singapore still currently does not recognize Singapore Sign Language as a national language. And an example, another example of this is that we only have five full-time interpreters in the country. Um, so with civil society and implementation, in 2016, the Singapore government set up a steering committee um, that has representatives from different civil society organizations to draft and adopt the different enabling master plans. And while civil society is generally involved in the initial stages of consultation, it is, um, this is within focus group discussions. These discussions are shared as recommendations to the implementation committee, which will then choose which recommendations to implement. The steering committee does not have information about which recommendations are implemented by the implementation committee. So there's a bit of a gap right there. Also, there's only one feedback channel for members of the public to provide feedback, and this is for a general public, people with and without disabilities. And many times when VWOs, uh, those are voluntary welfare organizations for disabilities, are consulted, their staff members without disabilities are usually the ones that are involved in consultations. Um, at times, consultations with DPOs and people with disabilities are done only as a formality. So for example of this is recently, my experience of it was um, we were consulted to bring in people with disabilities to check the accessibility and functions of a new airport terminal that we had only after it was constructed and nothing else could be changed. So that's, that's an interesting concept. Um, sorry. So a little bit more about DPA. Um, we are Singapore's only cross-disability organization dedicated to advocacy, and this is why we have currently taken on the uphill kind of a battle for doing our parallel report for the CRPD. And it's also Singapore's first time presenting at the UN. Um, so how we do this is we invite a number of advocates with disabilities to attend a workshop where we taught them a little bit more about the CRPD, the importance and why it's so critical for them to have their feedback shared. Um, so in order to involve everybody, it wasn't just people with disabilities, it was also uh, care to, sorry, we included parents of kids with disabilities so that we can have a caregiver perspective. Um, unfortunately, there were no representatives of people with psychosocial disabilities and intellectual disabilities. And, Honestly, getting access to these communities is a bit of a challenge in Singapore. Also, there was no, despite our best efforts, there was no uh, official representation by DPOs, uh, disability organizations. This could possibly be, be because of potential repercussions to their current operations because a lot of them are currently funded by the government for to run their daily operations and things like that. So when it comes to a parallel report, it might be seen as critiquing um, the Singapore government. Um, so this is currently how DPA has uh, constructed our CRPD working group. Um, we act as a secretariat um, so that we ensure that the input into the report is only by people with disabilities, for people with disabilities. And we organize monthly meetings for working group members and feedback sessions for people without disabilities. And this includes 
um, parents, uh, family members, friends, anyone who's involved in the disability sector of some sort. So these are some barriers faced. Um, because the environment in Singapore is better than it used to be, not all people with disabilities consider it critical to advocate for the full rights as listed in the CRPD. And this is also a lack of urgency in fighting for disability rights. There's also a lack of cohesion and collaboration by disability organizations. Um, a lot of these communities work in silos, and so they focus a lot more on service providing rather than realizing the human rights impacts of the CRPD. Um, also in Singapore, people with disabilities are generally viewed as uh, charity cases, not really as empowered individuals who have or should have a say for what they, what they need and what they want in the country. However, having said this, the mindset is changing with the younger generation that tends to go to university and mix around with a, with a larger community. Um, there's also a lack of activism culture in Singapore due to a fear of um, repercussions. So this is my question. Um, so one point of contention that we have in Singapore is that DPOs should not have an input in the parallel report because they are often led by people without disabilities. And my question is, should DPOs work with disability advocates to implement CRPD in Singapore? Thank you. Uh, sorry, I will open it up. It's up, it's up to you. Yes, up to you guys. OK. Yes, who says yes? Perhaps yes, give me a bit that more light. They like should work with disability they advocates. Should, OK. And who says it, they should that not they should work? should not work with disability advocates. Everybody else? The other ones are sleeping a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think it's a slight majority, and then there is a large majority who needs a coffee. But there are another <laughs> 20 minutes. Uh, we will be here. Right? Uh, I'm sorry for that, but the uh, door is open. <laughs> okay, thank you, Teresa. It's your turn. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting us um, to this. Thank you for the ESL Foundation and and. It is a pleasure for us to be here at Zero Project. Um, all right, my, my name is Teresa Roya and I work for the Technical Secretariat of DHUB, um, Disability Hub Europe for Sustainable Growth and Social Innovation. This is the entire name of the project that I'm presenting today. It is a multi-stakeholder engagement initiative uh, aimed at building a reference space or platform uh, for best practice exchange, dissemination, mutual learning, and raising awareness of the binomial disability and sustainability. So I, I think this is the point of uh, differentiation of this project. We try to work together uh, on the same field of disability and sustainab um, sustainability. So the final goal of DHAB is to foster this social and labor inclusion of people with disabilities in Europe while promoting inclusive and sustainable businesses. It's worth to mention that the uh, DHAB is uh, led by Fundación ONCE. Fundación ONCE is the leading organization in Spain to, uh, of, that works for inclusion of people with disabilities, all kinds of disabilities. And this project is also supported by the European Social Fund. Uh, DHAB will be operating until December 2020. Uh, with the possibility of extending this activity longer in time, hopefully. Um, and we think that DHAB is a unique initiative with a cross-sector and pan-European approach that builds upon the successful experience of a, a previous project called CSR Plus D, European Network, uh, which ended in, in 2015 and was also co-funded by the European Social Fund. So um, um, it is interesting to say that the hub is also aligned with the Agenda 2030. We cannot forget that we are also working on sustainability as well. And, and you, you probably, all of you know that uh, disability is also present in the sustainable development goals. So that's why we try to be aligned with all the sustainability agendas, because we really want to enhance, you know, and, and, and to move forward disability in the, uh, in the agendas of all the governments and on, of all the, the companies that are working um, uh, to, to meet the sustainable development goals. That's the reason why. Uh, DHAB is also aligned with the United Nations Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities, uh, the European Disability Strategy, uh, the EU Strategy on CSR, and, and the UA 2020 Strategy for Sustainable, Smart and Inclusive Growth. 
um, th that's why we, we're trying to be aligned with all the, these um, uh, sustainability and disability agendas. So I would say that the, the, these, the broad objectives of the hub is to foster these best practices, uh, exchange and mutual learning, uh, giving a space of visibility at EU level uh, to reference companies and organizations, generate sharing knowledge, instrument analysis and methodologies. And this is the reason why we are here today, uh, speaking about these analysis instruments and methodologies. Um, before speaking about the, the first output, we would like to, I would like to present to you uh, about data and, and, and about um, indicators. Just to mention that we are also working with some partners like um, uh, L'Oréal, uh, Dow Chemical Company, uh, Global Reporting Initiative, EDF, uh, CSR Europe, and, and some others. And we have an approach, like a different approach uh, towards people with disabilities. We really believe that this uh, 360 approach means that inclusion has many faces. From a corporate perspective, people with disabilities can be seen as employees, as a final consumer, uh, can be a supplier, an employer, uh, are part obviously of the community. So DHAB works on this multi-focus as uh, inclusive workplaces, employment of people with disabilities, innovation and accessibility. That's why we are uh, our first output of this project of Disability Hub Europe that we are launching uh, the 21st uh, of March in the European Parliament when we will do the official launch of the Disability Hub. This is the guidance on disability and sustainability reporting jointly with Global Reporting Initiative, which is the, the, the reference organization in sustainability reporting. Why we are working with them? Because all the organizations around the world, we could say that more than 80% of all the companies that are providing a non-financial report, they are using this guidance. So if we include disability uh, throughout, uh, th uh, along the guidance to all the indicators they are providing to companies, then probably we can move forward and, and open the, their mind in trying to disclose on disability along their organizations. Here you have some examples of the indicators uh, we are using, like uh, we can include disability at an employment and decent work level, or we can speak about accessibility and include the disability concept as well. And we can speak about business relationships and uh, talk about disability as well. So what we think is that uh, everything that is not measured, what is not measured can't be managed. That's why transparency is one of the, um, the first aims of DHAP. So we have been uh, facing many challenges while uh, we are trying the organizations to be disclosing on disability at their management level and, and the uh, disability to be included in the development of products and services. So here's the, the, the question for you. We have found out that uh, you know, although transparency or corporate reporting is positive to create this culture of disclosure, um, probably when you are grabbing raw data, you find that it's not comparable at all. And my question to you, maybe it's not a yes or not, but I wonder myself, how can the information regarding inclusion of people with disabilities at a corporate level can be comparable if raw data very often is, uh, is biased? Um, do you agree or not that it's worth to create a taxonomy for reporting? It is worth to create uh, standards for comparability among companies. Do you really think that this would help to be uh, the corporates more transparent and therefore to include disability in their, uh, in their management level? Yes or not? Okay. okay. Thank you. It was more clear than before. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll take it as a yes. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Teresa. It was very interesting. Uh, it was the first round now of the panel, and I have the impression, well, there's not enough research, 
we definitely should include people with disabilities in research, in data collection, in designing of uh, surveys, of uh, qualitative methods uh, to gain data. Um, it's not quite clear what the organizations play uh, for a role, the service providers, are they just doing some kind of service provision or should or could they also do more voice, more advocacy? Um, and uh, then there was the question of harmonizing uh, and of uh, implementing like more standards in GRI for example. Uh, I would like to take this up now and uh, go through the panel once again and uh, ask you um, to comment on that, on what you heard, on the questions, uh, and uh, yeah, let's open the second round and perhaps uh, we start again uh, with you, Daphne. Okay. It's another, like, let's say, three, four minutes three, four uh, time minutes. for you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, first of all, thank you panel list for all these very interesting uh, presentations. I think uh, uh, the, one of the core topics indeed was about uh, whether we should involve people with disabilities and, and there was clear consensus also from the audience. I think it's very important. It's uh, about inclusion. It's about inclusive uh, societies and maybe even uh, more specifically it's about expertise, and uh, uh, there's a strong need for involving people that have the expertise and, and the experience, especially when it comes uh, to definitions, because it's really difficult uh, to get that right. Um, uh, we, we spoke a little bit about harmonization, and I think uh, the challenge really is, is that we're talking about a very heterogeneous group, of people, when we talk mm -hmm. about people with disabilities, it's uh, many, many facets of it. Um, and so what we need is a good understanding of what is being measured. Um, I liked uh, very much what Christine was saying about mixing quantitative and qualitative. Uh, um, and especially there, I think we can do much more with uh, with engaging people with with disabilities. I think, of course, today's conference, or this conference here, is a great uh, opportunity to bring people together and uh, um, to work to, yeah, to, to work together. Um, I also wanted to say that, yes, the, the social surveys have their limitations, but uh, they do have a, a, a function as offering sort of a starting point and of, um, allowing some comparability with the situation of people uh, without disabilities. So uh, there is a need not only uh, because you want to know uh, what kinds of problems, but you also want to be able to understand uh, uh, the differences and, and the specific needs uh, required. Um, oh yeah, and then we had the question about what we can do um, if data can be harmonized and if it can be used to enhance uh, quality of life, people with disabilities. I had written down a couple of things there. Um, so I really think that the ICF approach that you speak about uh, can be harmonized. And if I understand correctly, the Washington group questions, that, that short questionnaire uh, does that. Uh, um, I think what's really important, and that's where I come in a little bit as a survey researcher, is that uh, um, it's not just about the idea, but it's also about the practice and the process. So you have to make sure that you, uh, uh, the way you translate the items into each language or into each specific situation is really important. Uh, so it has to be the conceptual understanding but also the technical so you know how you do it whether you do it uh, face to face or whether you do it online or th there's so many uh, things that come into play there um, and there's I think quite a couple of um, things that are going on um, 
There are guidelines that are developed by the University of Michigan on cross-cultural surveys, how you should do them. So they call them the three MC surveys, multinational, multi-regional, and multicultural. And I think also for this type of research, it's very important to follow those guidelines. Um, yeah, I think that's thank my you. contribution. Yeah, thank you for your insight. May I pass on to you? Thank you. And I, I, I think I would like to express uh, my uh, impression about two, two points. I think including persons with disabilities is, is important and it is, um, but we can take it as a matter of capacity building, not only building capacity for persons with disabilities, but also building capacity of us who are without um, disabilities trying to understand each other. And I think it's the way of um, trying to communicate with each other as well. Like we are trying to put ourselves into the person with disability shoes and then learn what they perceive or what difficulties that they encounter. And also I would like to invite person with disabilities to work with us and to understand what we think. Because probably we might, let's say that we think for them, but without uh, true understanding so I think by including persons with disabilities is also important and I totally support the idea of that. And the second issue I would like to say is about the data comparison across different organizations are important and I think that we need to have um, standardization of data collection and ICF is one method that we can um, use this classification system um, trying to collect data. But the most important is we have to sit together and then talk and discuss what the data or what information that we want to get out of the data and then we can design or which um, set of data and how to translate and how to use the information to support our work. So I think that's two issues that I want to make. Thank you. That's a good point. Talking uh, is always um, shows up a way how to solve problems uh, of people with disabilities and without uh, obvious disabilities. Because I think uh, each and every person in this room has some kind of disability. And uh, when I think of getting older, then most of us will get some kind of difficulties and perhaps disabilities as well. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Christine. Uh, you should press push. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Um, a really interesting debate, and I think the challenge that we all have is essentially how do we build the, the capacity, the quality, and the comparability of insight we're putting out um, and we're using and we're building and deciding upon. And there's a number of you know, elements to pull apart in there. One is one, um, Daphne, you talked about, which is that designing the research alongside people with access needs right at the front. Um, we do that by having panel leads. So within our community, we've got a community of about 400 people with various access needs or over 65, and there's a community lead for each of the major communities, such as hearing, sight, mobility, complex conditions, older, etc., etc. When we're designing the research, any research, they're involved right at the front, and they'll go, hang on, you might have forgotten about, or there's this element, not just the how, but also the what. What are the things that we're asking, and are we actually probing into the areas of most interest and engagement for them, or the, the gaps that are there? So when we're designing research, design it alongside people that are prepared to kind of help us, not just with the how, but also with the what. The other thing, the comparability, I think, is a really interesting point. We did comparable research piece last year on a particular industry in a particular element of technology where we designed the research top to bottom to make it truly comparable. Um, we're doing another one this year around AI support, assistive technology assessments, 
which we're going to use the ICF as a, as a base with uh, a base for, so that it's going to be comparable over different in environments. And I think that comparability makes it much more usable by more people over more time, and it essentially empowers that insight um, to be more durable. So as a research um, uh, community, I think that really helps all of us rather than just that research and that particular question. The last thing I'd really touch on is the, the heterogeneity of both the questions and the populations that we're talking about. And it's not a population, it's the populations. And really, it is complex, it does take time. Christian, you mentioned before, it takes quality researchers. Don't try and shortcut it because of the complexity of it. It does take, the more time you put up front, the better quality the insight. When you actually make change, back to the Singapore example of asking for insight after the airport's built, it's not very useful. You may as well just throw that money away. Put in a little bit more money and effort up front, and the quality of the product, the service, the policy that you're going to create out the back end will be so much higher. It really will be worthwhile. Thank you very much. Um, I keep an eye to, to the time and uh, just hand over to you, Francesca. Thank you. Uh, well, I also thought that all the presentations were really interesting. Uh, in, f in terms of uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities, I think that the AR index is, uh, is, a, is a, um, an example, an illustration of how uh, a considerable potential uh, uh, there is in involving advocacy uh, organizations in data collection. So uh, when official statistics are not available, so I think I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I think it's, it's very important that. Um, in, I just want to make a distinction here, though. Uh, we are um, uh, measuring mainly uh, what we do in our survey is we are in, in measuring how the, uh, basically the uh, environmental barriers. Uh, the, our focus is not on, on the persons, but on the environmental barriers. So that, that's a, a distinction also I wanted to make. Um, that can, came to mind. Uh, our respondents evaluate the three categories of variables in a fairly objective and fact-based fashion. So, um, in, in, in any case, I think for demographics and, and, and censuses, uh, we, we really support, and that comes to the comparability of uh, um, data and so on. Uh, we support and advocate the use of the uh, I, I, SP, um, ICF, sorry, uh, and of fun functional questionnaires. Uh, and I think one important aspect I would like to make is the accessibility, actually, of the interview or questionnaires um, submission process. So this is still, uh, I think, an area that deserves a great deal of attention, especially now that technology is, is used. So. Um, this is something else I want to say. Um, and I think this is probably my, my considerations so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. yeah. Sumita. Um, so I think my panelists have pretty much uh, wrapped up a lot of the points I wanted to say. But um, I think three things that really jumped out at me and it kind of also mulled while I was listening to everybody else is. I think we can all agree that data is important. I mean, the more you have it, the better it is. Whether it be qualitative or quantitative, there's no argument there. But having said that, I think also when we do disability research, we should be mindful of the fact that disability is not just disability. It's a very cross-sectional um, issue. You know, it crosses between gender, education, employment, all sorts of different things. So. I think this is also something else that we need to build into other, other types of research, not just disability research, you know. Um, for example, if we're doing a, a gender census for, 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 for some sort of policy, disability should be a part of that, as it is part of every, every other thing. Um, also, lastly, just to wrap up, um, I think when surveying communities without disabilities, you know, outside of disability research, um, we should keep in mind that we are still interviewing people with people who are involved in the disability sector in some sort of way, either through families, friends, 
um, people they work with, people that they're around. And given you know today's everyone's living a lot longer, it's, it's, it's a part of aging as well. And I think this is an important factor that we need, to, we need to be mindful of, that every research that we do, or every research that's being done, has a disability component involved in it in some way. And I think that's a very um, critical part that we need to start taking note of. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Um, the more, the better, but be careful of heterogeneity topics. Yes. I think it's a good point. Teresa, you okay? it's up Thank to you. you. Um, I think all of the points has been already touched by my, my colleagues and, and I would like to thank you all for your, uh, your speeches. They, they are fantastic. But I, I would like to raise awareness on a couple of things. Um, uh, the first question, obviously the inclusion of people with disabilities uh, uh, in the, the surveys and collecting that data, obviously yes, but not only about if we are talking about making studies and research, uh, that they should be included on all the phases of developing products, services, uh, research and development, innovation, in all of the stages that we can imagine of developing product services consulting, they obviously should be included. Otherwise, we uh, are not able to give the appropriate response. And secondly, if we speak about reporting, we usually um, consider some certain principles of good reporting. Uh, one of these is obviously the inclusion of stakeholders. Uh, if I want to communicate something within my organization, company, whatever, I should be asking the others what they should be, uh, uh, they, what they would like to know from my uh, organization. So. Uh, this is one of the points. A good principle of reporting is asking the others and what they uh, would like to know. And other thing is about comparability. Uh, comparability among the, um, you know, the studies and reports among companies uh, very often is not that easy. Comparability and standardization is good and many of you have said yes. We would like to be to have standards to report on certain things and to let the companies to be comparable and therefore uh, we should we, we would know which company are performing better. But uh, probably if we go to that comparably, we are missing a lot of relevant information that is material and unique for each one for each organization. And that's the magic thing. Um, Christine was talking about uh, qualitative and quantitative data. How can we combine both and make conclusions out of that? So I would say that the challenge, in certain way, um, we should be working on comparability of certain issues, but others, we should be um, uh, focusing on those differences and those materiality of things depending on the information we are looking at. Thank you very much. It's mm. like, uh, could be a uh, closing uh, sentence. Uh, yeah, tailor-made versus comparability. Uh, we learn much more about the tailor-made studies, about the uh, insights getting, we get out of qualitative analysis. And I have very often the impression that with the raw data, uh, it's like, there's like um, I have the feeling that there needs more more blood, more uh, information, more uh, to look, more possibilities to look behind. Yeah. Well, but it's uh, now about you and your questions. We have another 15 minutes here, um, and uh, I invite you to raise your hands or your body again, and uh, we will collect. Uh, I suppose I'd say now three questions and then perhaps we can have a second round uh, and uh, we here on the panel will try to give an answer. There was one, one question here. Would you like to start? Perhaps? Yes, my name is Jennifer Mizrahi from Respectability. You spoke a lot about how to collect data appropriately. I wanted to ask you about how you use data and how you deal with um, 
bias in the data. So in the United States, um, we tend to collect data for people with disabilities who are quote unquote living in community. And uh, people of color are frequently put into the criminal justice system. So we have 2.2 million people who are incarcerated in our country, more than three quarters of a million in whom are people with disabilities. And they don't get counted in many of the studies around disability. Likewise, because they're afraid, immigrants frequently um, don't fill out any questionnaires. So Latinas, these are huge segments of our population. In our schools today, the majority of children with disabilities are black and brown kids, um, but they're consistently being undercounted. So I'm wondering how you're dealing with sort of um, minorities who are within your disability population who might be otherwise marginalized. And I'm wondering how you use data um, politically. So for example, I know with our organization that when we see data that shows that one state is better than another state, whoever is worst on the list, we go and we visit with their governor. You know, I met with the governor of, of Maine and I said, you're the worst in the country on X, the worst. And within one year, there was such a change. It was unbelievable. So I'm wondering how you're using your data to advance the advocacy of the movement. Thank you very much. Is there a second question over there and then there? Please. Yeah, you. Thank you. Hi, this is Shalini from India. And uh, taking a little from where Jennifer stopped, um, so I don't know how it is in your countries or other countries uh, about the census. Uh, in our country, the census of 2011 declared that there are about 30 million people with disabilities, but our uh, estimates are that there are many more. So we are dealing with this huge problem of uh, the disabled people not coming out with their details when the surveys are done. Um, I don't know if it's out of the fear or if it is out of the stigmas associated with disability for a very long time. But um, we're not going on to the qualitative surveys. There's a huge lac lacuna there. But even the basic quantitative surveys have not been able to generate um, you know, statistics enough to let the policymakers make decisions um, for people with disabilities uh, in our country to an optimum potential, at least. So how do you deal with that in your countries? I, I would really like to understand. Uh, enough awareness, uh, is, everybody is trying to spread awareness about answering the questions rightly, but I feel that caretakers of uh, people with disabilities, children with disabilities, they have to be taken very seriously also when information is being collected, something what Sumita also said. Uh, because there are so many people with disabilities who are not able to verbalize or clearly, you know, express um, so many realities and so many problems themselves. There are myriad disabilities in the world. Uh, I, I don't know if all are known to us by now or not. And, and uh, not being able to express clearly uh, is not something very rare. Uh, we all are aware about this reality, so I, I would love to understand how do you deal with that in your countries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's collect the third question and then go to the panel. Over there, lady with grey. Hi, my name is Amy A. Bernoff. I'm a Harkin Fellow researcher. And I just had a question about um, your surveys and your uh, both your qualitative and your quantitative research of how involved do you have people with disabilities in item construction and then also piloting your, uh, your questions before you actually submit surveys. Thank you very much. Then uh, I will switch now to the panel and then I think a second round will be possible. Um, perhaps uh, the first two questions are quite similar. It's like about the bias. It's like about the uh, problems with data and perhaps we can also include the caregiver uh, situation, means third party. Uh, I look now a bit more on this side of the panel because it's like more on the survey side. Perhaps uh, 
Christine or Siri or Daphne, you want to, to give an answer? Okay, yeah. <laughs> great. Please jump in. Um, first question, really good question. How do you use the data? We talked about how you gather it. It's not useful having it if nobody does anything with it. So we always try and work with our clients to translate everything into their language, to translate it into the things that are their priorities at the moment and to translate it into things that... I, I talk about looking for the moving streams so if there's already stuff underway, trying to put things into those moving streams because there's enough momentum there that it can pick up with. Recognising bias, the number one thing to recognise bias is to recognise that you're looking for it. And you will always have it. In fact, I was listening to some stuff this morning that, you know, yet again reminding us that we have them and it doesn't matter how much you try and pull them, away, pull them out, they will be there. But if you specifically look for it, if when you're designing research you have a range of people that will have different biases, you'll pick up different things from each other as well. So the more you can socialise research before you start, the better it'll be, and the more you actively and pro, you know, proactively look for it, the better it'll be. But then, let's be real, it will always have bias associated with it, so just recognising the limitations of what you've got. Lastly, you're talking about politically and the how to catch people getting it, you know, sharing when people get it wrong. Um, we share when people get it right and we try and catch people getting it right and we talk about it specifically as that and we try and catch leading practice and highlight that and make people feel very proud of that rather than catching people where they get it wrong. We'll tell people privately um, where they're at and where they are and, and overall, but actually we expose publicly where people get it right and we love catching good stories. Um, Last thing in terms of the using it and, and that aligning with moving streams, something I, I noted down that I, I forgot to mention on that, align it to the mainstream research. What's really hard for organisations or for anyone making a decision, whether it's a policy decision or a product decision, is if they're getting four or five different lots of insight in and they don't all add up to each other, they've got to then pick apart what's most relevant, what's most useful and to try and develop priorities. If prior to delivering it to a client, or, or if you can design the, the work right up front so that all the research is kind of being amalgamated in, in fact, preferably even designed from the start in alignment with each other, then there's one set of insights that covers the full community and the full decisions being made. That makes it much more usable to people rather than having lots of individual pieces that have to be then brought together. Thank you. Perhaps Siri. Uh, thank you very much for the questions, and I, I think that the question, I think it's not the questions, but it gives me more thoughts about how I am going to work with, and I'm going to dealing with the data disabilities, and I think to my my position, I think I am on the on the journey as well, and uh, I would like to try to answer the how to present the data, which uh, after I collect. Um, in the community. Actually, in Thailand, we have a um, registration system uh, trying to uh, register per person with disabilities. So we, when you are registered, you can gain benefits of um, government um, uh, benefit package, something like that. But I am seeing that some people, even though they are registered, they cannot get access to the, the services that they should have. So by going out in the field and trying to see in each individual person with disabilities who sometimes be hidden in the, in the deep uh, uh, portion of deep section of the kitchen, when we see that and we count them, and I think we can just um, try trying to, to make them more visualized. And now when we can just doing the systematical um, representation of the data, we can get attention from the policy makers. And at the moment, we are working with the um, like local government. And, and next week, I and my colleague are going to speak with the national level organization and trying to um, present our result of survey and then trying to tell them that there are more of persons with disabilities who are in need and they have to 
do something about it, and we are going to provide that technical um, expertise from what we experience from the field. And the, from the, the bias of the data, I think from my experience, when I went out in the field in the northern part of Thailand where there are so many minorities, and the interviewers came back to me and asked whether we are going to, to ask the question about that person because they are like from, uh, from abroad or there are no Thai um, citizens. And then I just asked the um, community leaders and they said yes, because we live in the same community and we help them anyway. So I think from the community spirit, um, they, they are trying to help with um, many, with um, everybody who are in need. So for the bias, I think this is um, what we should take into account and then making a better round of survey next time when we have the opportunity. So I think I just take it as the suggestion to do my work better. Okay, thank you. Uh, with a glimpse on the time, I would like to uh, collect two other questions and then uh, do some kind of closing round. Uh, the lady here was, I think, at the beginning. Um, so more of a thought or comment than a question, uh, linking back to the comparability part. Uh, I think data would be a lot more comparable if every research defined how they use the concept disability. Um, you're going to capture a completely different group of people if you use self-identification or if you use a medical definition or the Washington group. Uh, and I see a lot of research reports which don't include one sentence saying, I identified people with disabilities this way. Uh, and I think we could make our data a lot more comparable if only that was added to all of our research. Okay, thank you. Please. Uh, hello, my name is Arthur Limmerreich from the University of Luxembourg. I have a very short question, so maybe there may be a third question, a very short question, okay. and very, with maybe be answered with yes or no. In your survey about uh, the employment situation of persons with disabilities, do you include persons who are going to sheltered workshops to the employment group, or are they going to the unemployment group? Okay, thank you. I take the question. I think it's... Uh, question. Your, your question, then let's collect the third one with you and then we are going to close the audience yeah, it's, session. It's, it's also uh, more a comment than, um, than a question. Please, uh, a short, short comment. Yeah, in, okay. the in the case of Spain, um, I, I want to remember that uh, the convention has an article that uh, establishes the um, commitment to states to have uh, statistics on disability. So uh, this is uh, crucial. In the case of Spain, we have two ways of measuring. One is self-perception, which is a survey that is each 10 years made. Now we are launching the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the next uh, round of this uh, survey. And, uh, and it is necessary also advocacy in this field, because National Statistics Office in Spain uh, constitute a group of experts where the disability movement is included. So we go to the, the, those meetings. And also, um, the other way is uh, based on registered data from different um, uh, public services. So uh, you have identified persons, and then you can cross with other uh, service and other investigations. But uh, coming from public statistics, which is quite crucial for comparability and, and to progress in harmonization. Thank you very much. Um, I think the problem with the national statistics system, and we had uh, like the um, uh, study, the research I mentioned before in Austria as well, is that there is a systemic bias because the national statistics systems don't ask people in institutions. It means like they are going, you said it before, just to households, and therefore you can do whatever you want with a national statistic uh, institution. They, uh, we, we did it as well, but they, uh, they don't go to the institutions. And we tried to, to get uh, along with that, to um, show uh, ways how they could uh, ask 
questions. And it is not just a problem for people with disabilities, but also for older people, people living in nursing homes. It's also about people living in prisons. It means like quality of life service. We read in Europe, for example, they overestimate the quality of life for people in the country because they just uh, look at a uh, part of the population that is, uh, well, uh, a, a bit better off, I suppose. Um, well, so much to this. Um, perhaps I hand yeah. over to you, because it's, first of all, the direct question from the colleague from Luxembourg, yeah. and then I think perhaps you can also uh, comment on, on, on the other questions as well, and then uh, you can also. Sure. sure. Yeah, so uh, the first direct question is yes. So the survey is a random probability sample of people living in private households, but then within the private household, you are asked about your employment status, but it wouldn't be an, uh, a factor to exclude you if you were in sheltered employment. So it would just be registered what kind of uh, form of employment you're in. Um, so that's the good answer. The bad answer is uh, what Christian just said, and I think that's that's the, the bigger problem. Uh, the bias happens uh, not only because of um, us not covering people living in, in all kinds of uh, institutions, but with languages. So we have language barriers. We only interview in a, in a set of languages uh, that are spoken within the EU. So we exclude uh, a large immigrant population. Um, but I wanted to come back to, to how to solve it. So I, I, I liked uh, Jennifer's point because the fact that you have so many people incarcerated in the US with uh, um, uh, disabilities or mental health problems is a little bit of a chicken egg. I mean, I, I would hope that you don't incarcerate so much or that you don't institutionalize so much. And um, also with surveys, I think the, the aim should not be per se uh, to now go into institutions, but to really develop policies that people aren't institutionalized. So in the long run, I think that's where really our focus should lie. And I know there, there are sort of more short-term attempts to do surveys uh, specifically uh, among people with disabilities in Europe by covering institutions. Uh, there's a program called INGRID that does data collection um, of different subgroups of the population, and they're really looking specifically at including them. But again, as I said, I, I think that's, that's a short-term solution, and, and we should really see how we can better de-institutionalize. Um. Thank, Thank you for that. Um, now I look on the other side of the panel. Um, I, any yeah. comments or I can I can here? make a, like yeah, a another brief three minutes, two comment. minutes. <laughs> yeah, one, just one minute. Um, yeah, I would say that although the private sector or foundations or organizations that are working on this um, uh, developing of harmonization of data, uh, how the methodologies, how to report. Uh, although we, we try to, you know, to improve uh, and go to the progress in harmonization, I would say that a national statistics uh, institutions should be uh, improving their systems of collecting data. Because as you said, if you close your eyes and you, don't, uh, you take out the vulnerable groups, you will never have the entire photography, so you cannot improve. So that means that is the beginning of visibility if we want to improve our decision-making system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so also as a closing, I think um, for me it was interesting about the cultural differences that you have in a community uh, all over the place. And I think also it's important to, you know, in order to get accurate information, instead of just asking, for example, in surveys, whether you have a disability or not, because different people identify disabilities in different ways. And what might be a disability to me might not be a disability to someone else. Um, so I think this is where, for example, so the Washington group of questions is very important. I think one of my panelists uh, mentioned it. And it kind of breaks it down into the six, the activities of daily living. And when you do that, I think everyone has a more common understanding of what you know, the question is actually asking. And I think through that way, we might be able to get 
more accurate data than something that's very subjective. Thank you. Thank you. Some concluding remarks? <laughs> Yes, well, um, I think uh, um, looking at what we, we do as an NGO and looking the f to the fact that uh, for years uh, we, we are repeating that we're missing data and so on, we, as an NGO we try to actually to fill a gap. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm going back to the question how, uh, you know, the d data collected are used. So we really hope that uh, what we... Um, Collected uh, and put available on, on you know, a sort of in a, in a way of a shadow report, <laughs> in a way, mm -hmm. uh, can be used by advocates and also by those uh, advocates in governments to see which are their country gaps uh, and where those gaps can be filled. And uh, so, yes, that's, I think, it, it, we hope that the DARE index can help fill that. Uh, you know. Thank you, yes. You're right. Last remark. I might just have one last comment, which kind of goes to something we, I didn't address before, which was the lady who asked, how do you get people who can't express themselves well? It's a really important question. I personally don't believe that there is, that there are people out there that can't share what their experience is. And there's behavioural analysis, there's attitudinal analysis, so you can ask people what they think, or you can watch people and see what they do. Um, we use all sorts of very uh, varied tools from co-creation of actually, if, you, if you're looking at signs or talking about signs, make the sign that works for you. We'll have all the different bits and people can mm -hmm. actually physically make it. And then if someone doesn't want to make it, they can go and point to the one that they like best. Or say we, we use games, we use different ways of addressing it, whether it's verbal, written or visual. Most people want to engage and most people can be listened to. It just takes time to consider the right environment to provide that, to either get that behavioural or attitudinal input back. Thank you. Any comments from you or shall we close? I just want to say that do, doing data is like both and the means and the ends. By, by looking at it as the end, of course, I, we are just counting the number of persons with disabilities and also what perspective that we would like to measure. And also data collection is also the means as well because they can just raise awareness and what we have talked, we have discussed also give me an idea or inspiration to, to do my work more better and more inclusive for persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, then um, the last remark, perhaps also on the, no, the lady is not in anymore, but I uh, would say ask people themselves. And if they don't uh, can answer in, with normal speech, there will be other ways. I would really mm. re like to stress this because we did some research on that point and uh, there are really severe biases if you ask third parties uh, about the life. Uh, you ask, whom do you ask? Caregivers, parents, teachers, uh, and they have their own impressions and in interests also uh, with the people. Uh, Perhaps we can uh, conclude with that and uh, I thank you very, very much uh, to attend this uh, forum. I hope uh, there is uh, one or other little thing you take with you at home. I think there's a lot of uh, things need to be done uh, in future uh, to raise data, to um, uh, bring data to the politicians and to uh, like force them to decide on topics and uh, perhaps we can uh, meet again next year or the year after the next year uh, and can uh, report that uh, there is uh, some uh, success story uh, based on data as well and now I wish you a safe, confident and uh, hopefully supported, I read it before, uh, journey home or nice evening in Vienna or whatever uh, your program is today in the evening. And thank you to the panelists here. It was a great discussion, a great uh, presentation from you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.